um, you know, going after these hate crimes, they're miss the data is missing from the FBI report that's released every year. So we're hoping to um, have this bill reintroduced in the next Congress, the 117th Congress, once it's sworn in. So with that, Daisy and Sean, I'll turn it back to you if you have any questions. Um, thank you so much. I, um, uh, we wanted to just see if there were any specific questions for Natalia, because we have a few minutes uh, before Natalia, because Natalia has to leave. So if there are any specific questions for Natalia, if you could please put it in the chat, um, if we can, any questions for Natalia? Yeah, I know I went through a number, a lot of numbers and people are fascinated by them. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the numbers, I think, uh, as you point out, are uh, alarming as it is, um, but, I was very surprised the first time I learned that reporting is essentially voluntary. Mm -hmm. uh, voluntary for law enforcement offices to provide this, these figures to the FBI. Um, is there any more detail you might be able to share about the proposed legislative responses to this? Um, it may still be in the early stages, but um, you know, how, how can we get more consistent and reliable national level data? I think there, there are a number of factors um, up regarding this. Right now, law enforcement authorities are overwhelmed with you know, just trying to make sure that they get the conviction and they're focused on the case itself rather than uh, submitting information to the FBI. And the FBI system is a little wonky and it takes a while for people to get training and there needs to be an updating of handbooks. And, and lastly, and most importantly, a lot of people don't feel comfortable coming forward to report these hate crime incidents to law enforcement uh, agencies. So there has to be a holistic view to try to resolve this, you know, um, law victims of hate crimes, especially among minorities, you know, they're scared of law enforcement authorities and especially if their immigration status is in question and they just don't have that trust factor built in. So a lot of people need to work up the courage and the law enforcement authorities need to build better relations with the community members. So they know that there's not gonna be an adverse reaction to them coming forward and reporting hate crimes. Yes, thank you. Well, um, the, the topic of the law uh, and legal measures leads us right into our next speaker, who's uh, Amy Spitalnik of Integrity First for America. Um, Amy is executive director of IFA and she brings with her over a decade of experience in government, politics and advocacy, uh, most recently as communications director and senior policy advisor to the New York Attorney General. Um, so Amy, there is a tradition of legal actions that have been very effective in disrupting white supremacist organizations. Um, the Aryan Nations was a massive influence and a uniting factor among far right extremists uh, throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, Thomas Metzger was another very influential figure. Um, they were bankrupted and their ability to perpetuate this terror was um, severely weakened. Um, I feel that your work is a continuation of that and so I'm very happy to turn the floor over to you to describe it. Thank you so much, Sean and Daisy and the whole WISE team um, and Natalia who has been a partner in our work. Um, and so many others here who uh, it's wonderful that you took the time out of your, your I'm sure busy holiday season to be here and learn about this. So we are grateful. Um, I think that's exactly right. There's a very strong tradition here of using our justice system to fight back against those who attack the institutions of our democracy. And that is what white supremacy is about in so many ways. Um, we, we see these white supremacists and other far-right extremists use harassment, use threats and violence as a means to undermine our most fundamental rights and the institutions that are at the core of our democracy. And we've seen this time and time again throughout history, but especially so over the last few years. We saw it in Charlottesville where peaceful protesters were attacked for standing up against hate coming to their communities. And we saw those same tactics used this year during the Black Lives Matter protests when those protesters were attacked by white supremacists and other extremists for exercising their rights. 
We saw it in Christ Church and Charleston and Pittsburgh and Poway, where people who were exercising their most fundamental right to freely practice their religion were killed in their houses of worship. And we saw it this year where extremists who are so often fueled by white supremacy and other far right ideologies used um, the election and the pandemic to drive violence and harassment and threats against not just individuals based on their race and religion, um, but also against our institutions and our democratically elected officials. And even just today, there was news coming out of Oregon of how white supremacists, Proud Boys and other extremists um, violently attacked the state house where they were holding a closed session on pandemic relief. And of course, we all know what has happened, for example, in Michigan, where legislators, where the Secretary of State and where the governor have all been attacked in some way or threatened by far-right extremists. But here's the thing, they are going after the institutions of our democracy, but we can use those same institutions as a means to fight back and hold them accountable and disrupt this horrific rising tide of hate that Natalia and Daisy and Sean have already described tonight. Um, and that's exactly what we are doing at Integrity First for America. We're using our justice system to hold accountable extremists for the racist violent conspiracy that they brought to Charlottesville three years ago. And this is a case that we know will have ripple effects, not just on the Charlottesville and Virginia communities, but on the broader national and potentially even global fight against these far right extremists. I wanna spend a couple minutes talking about what actually happened in Charlottesville three years ago um, and why litigation like this can then be so impactful in the fight against extremism it is not a silver bullet. There is so much more that needs to happen. And I know we're gonna be talking about so many of those other pieces here tonight. Um, but one way in which we can make a major difference on those who have already perpetrated violence and who are at the center of this cycle of extremism that has really reached record levels is by going after them in court and taking them on financially, operationally, and legally. What happened in Charlottesville was not an accident. I think many people think that there was this protest and a counter protest and it devolved into the car attack and the other violence, but it was not an accident. For months in advance on social media, particularly on a site called Discord, which is typically used by video gamers, these extremists planned the violence down from the mundane questions of what to wear, what to bring for lunch, to the horrific, how they could use their so, quote unquote free speech tools violently and whether they could hit protesters with cars and then claim self-defense, which is of course precisely what they did. And so when the violence unfolded in Charlottesville three years ago, it was the direct result of this long planned racist violent conspiracy to attack people based on their race, their religion and their willingness to defend the rights of others when these white supremacists came to their hometown. Um, and so we at IFA are representing uh, and supporting nine Charlottesville community members of diverse backgrounds who were violently attacked during that weekend. Um, some were attacked during the Tiki Torch March where they um, carried torches as a means to evoke the KKK and the Nazis and chanted things like Jews will not replace us, which um, is a direct uh, call out to replacement theory, which is the same white supremacist ideology we've seen in so many other attacks. Um, and they were violently attacked on UVA's campus. Others were attacked on Saturday, including many injured during the car attack itself. Um, and we're using a number of civil rights statutes in this case, but most notably something called the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, passed nearly 150 years ago. In fact, our trial next year will be exactly on uh, marking 150 years since this law was first passed, um, intended to hold accountable extremists, um, KKK members who terrorized recently freed slaves in the South um, during the Reconstructionist era and used a number of times since to hold accountable racist, violent conspiracies like the one that happened in Charlottesville. Um, it's also important to understand that the defendants in our Charlottesville case are of course responsible for what, for what happened three years ago, but also have deep disturbing connections to the broader cycle of white supremacist violence. We know that the Pittsburgh shooter communicated with some of the Charlottesville leaders before he killed 11 Jews praying in synagogue. We know that the Christ Church shooter who killed dozens and dozens of Muslims praying in mosque last year in New Zealand, New Zealand, New Zealand, Zealand wow, um, uh, 
funded Richard Spencer and Andrew England, who were two of our defendants and two very prominent American neo-Nazis, and painted onto his gun a white power symbol that was first popularized by another one of our defendants, Matthew Heimbach. And so we see over and over again that these are not lone wolves, these are not isolated incidents. This is a cycle of violence in which each attack is used to inspire the next one, oftentimes using social media to do so. And so our theory of change here is a simple one. By going after the leaders and the groups at the center of this movement, we can hold them accountable, we can disrupt them, we can bankrupt them, and we can dismantle them, um, which will have ripple effects that go well beyond Charlottesville. Holding them accountable, of course, deterring others and sending a crystal clear message of the very severe financial, legal, and operational consequences for this sort of violent hate. We've already seen the impacts firsthand. Richard Spencer complained in court the other month that this case is financially crippling. Um, and just a few weeks ago, we won evidentiary sanctions against a key neo-Nazi defendant, Elliot Klein, which means we've effectively won our case against him specifically. He was one of the lead organizers of Unite the Right. And that will have major impacts at trial, given that this is a conspiracy case. Um, there's so much more to say about the case, but I will leave it there. Um, encourage you all, um, if you are interested, to read the lawsuit, which you could find on our website at integrityfirstforamerica.org. Uh, you can also sign up for updates there, support the case directly um, if you're so inclined, and get involved in this legal effort however possible. Um, and I will just end by saying, I think in a year, certainly, and at a time when it's so easy to feel powerless and hopeless and scared, um, when the institutions of our democracy, democracy are under attack by these extremists, when we're hearing the hate and the bigotry fuel so much of the violence that has hit our communities, it's important to understand that we are not powerless. We can use those same institutions to fight back, and that is what we are doing. I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, and so I think often about what my grandparents lived through uh, in the 30s and 40s in Europe, and there's one major difference which is that we have a justice system. We have a rule of law. We have statutes like the Ku Klux Klan Act, and we can use them to do something about this violent hate and fight back. And I feel personally very lucky to be a part of that effort and to be a part of that effort with so many of the other brave, incredible advocates and fighters here tonight. Um, so thank you so much to Daisy and Sean and Wise and to everyone else here for sharing your incredible work. I'm really humbled and grateful to be a part of it and look forward to continuing to partner with all of you in the year ahead. Thank you so much, Amy. This was wonderful. And I would like to share something with all of you, those of you who've signed up. Uh, we'd like to share your email with Amy so they, you, they can stay in touch with you directly about the lawsuit. If you want to opt out, please send me an email and we'll do that as well. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful, great news, and I hope that we will hear some good news about the about the case soon. Um, uh, if if there's any specific question for Amy, this would be a really great time. But if you don't have a question, burning question right now, and you want to just keep it and send it through the chat, we can also uh, do that later on. Is that okay? I don't see any questions right now. All right, Amy. Thank you so much. Um, the uh, the individuals who you mentioned and the way in which white supremacists, extremists have this double image, how they present themselves in a certain way when they're being interviewed on mainstream media or when they are you know, uh, organizing in public, it's quite different from how they talk in private. Uh, and that's really where the nefarious um, uh, dishonesty of this movement is exposed. Um, that's one of the goals of our book is to expose how these groups think, how they act, um, and why by their own actions, they've shown that we cannot take them at their word or at face value. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Daisy to describe in more detail Wise Up White Supremacy. Uh, like with so many of our talks, there's not enough that we could fit in this presentation, but we're gonna focus on a couple of the aspects to give people and readers and communities more insight into how these groups think and how they weaponize um, common ideas. <clears throat> so, uh, Daisy Khan is an award-winning speaker, auth author, and activist. Uh, she's the founder of Women's Islamic Initiative in Spirituality and Equality, which is the largest global network of Muslim women committed to peace building, gender equality, and human dignity. Um, she published Wise Up, Knowledge Ends Extremism in 2017 to counter extremist distortions of Islam. 
and her work has been featured in Time, Newsweek, the New York Times, uh, CNN, Al Jazeera, the BBC. The list goes on, and I'm very honored to introduce Daisy Khan to talk about Wise Up. Thank well, you, Sean. Thank you very much. Uh, so I wanted to just share with everybody, um, I think, is, is my screen being shared? Hello? We can see you, uh, your face, but we don't see your desktop. Okay, so I just, sorry, apologies. I have to, I guess I have to do a screen share myself. Share screen. Okay. Okay, um, so I wanted to just mention why is Wise even doing this? Uh, Please don't let me interrupt, I'm, so, I'm sorry, real quick, but um, are you zoomed in? I'm not sure if everybody else sees what I'm seeing. Um, uh, is, uh, is, the full, is the full slide visible to? Uh, I think I'm sharing my screen now. Yeah, okay, very, very, very good, it's my settings, go on, apologies. Great, thank you so much. So I just wanted to mention why WISE is doing this because white supremacist ideologies are against literally every value represented by our organization. Uh, white supremacists are misogynists. They uh, believe that women are less fit for leadership in society and in home with limited roles apart from child raising and subordination to men. Uh, they are Islamophobic. Uh, they believe that Muslims will threaten white birth rates and constitutional law as pawns of a globalist conspiracy to replace white populations that Amy already mentioned and are actively targeted by hate crimes, which uh, Natalia just mentioned. Uh, they are revisionists, uh, much like ISIS was doing, they also use Christian scriptures and manipulate them to excuse bigotry and pagan traditions are exploited to excuse violence. Um, they are anti-egalitarian. Uh, their domination over inferior races or our cultures or separation into ethno states is believed to be inevitable and even desirable. The problem has become almost impossible for us to ignore. White supremacist extremism is resurgent across the globe. In the United States, white supremacist ideologies inspire the highest name of terrorist incidents, uh, contrary to what many believe, you know, people attribute uh, terrorism with Muslims, but that's not the case. The cause is the highest number of fatalities are contributed to white supremacists. Across America, uh, Europe, right-wing politicians have thrived. They're exploiting ethnic and religious stereotypes. They promote exclusionary nationalism against outsiders. Throughout the world, white supremacist movements are influencing each other in real time via the internet, are seizing the opportunity of current uncertainties, fake news, COVID-19, elections, and climate. So what is the solution? Uh, we know from our past work at WISE when we were working on, you know, trying to uh, undo what Daesh was doing in our communities, that is ISIS, we know that there is not a single solution. We need a holistic approach. So WISE UP, white supremacy is designed to re-educate the public on the nuances of this movement. And we want to reveal the core ideology that's common across white supremacist groups. There are many groups, many narratives, but there are some common <laughs> threads. We want to identify over a dozen different white supremacist organizations and movements of the present and the past. We will define their motivations, their target enemies, and how they weaponize religion. And finally, we will equip communities to prevent extremist attitudes and resist white supremacist propaganda within the communities. And just as a comparison, uh, here is a comparison of ISIS versus white supremacist foundation of their extremist ideology. This is fascinating because it shows you that although the groups might be very different, they actually have a core ideology. So ISIS um, labels anyone, the us versus them is one of the key foundations of both these groups. They label anyone, including Muslims of different sects and traditions as non-Muslim and secular states as infidel to justify their actions and hatred. Whereas white supremacists label anyone, including whites. Many of you who are in this room today would be included in among those whites as race traitors, culturally, intellectually, and morally inferior, incompatible with white society. Um, ISIS believes that there's pessimism about the state of the world and felt a sense of urgency about ending Muslim suffering around the globe. 
and they viewed themselves as saviors of Muslims. White supremacists view demographic shifts that outpace white birth rates and critique white privilege as white genocide, feeding their victim complex. ISIS believed that their gods specially appointed party charged with waging war and fulfilling prophecies of the ultimate battle between good and evil, which is the apocalyptic narrative that you also hear about with white supremacist groups who believe that they're soldiers in an impending and inevitable race war, or crusaders defending the Christian West from conquest by Muslims, Jews, Latinos, and leftists. And finally, ISIS was trying to regain or revive the past to gain legitimacy, and they wanted to establish a caliphate to create a land of God's chosen people. Of course, they would be that core chosen people. Whereas white supremacists seek to establish a white homeland to save white people from persecution and will eventually revive a European golden age. So how do they perceive their enemies and who are their enemies? <clears throat> we already know this, but just so we can take a closer look at it, uh, white supremacists disparage and demonize people outside their groups using extremely offensive and propaganda and misinformation. Okay. So black people are one of their top targets. Jews are second, immigrants are third, and Muslims are fourth. So this is how, these are some of the things that they say about black people, it's even hard for us to say these things because they're so offensive, but they demonize them as being prone to crime, prone to sexual deviancy, violent against white people. They blame their supposed genetic traits as lower intelligence, lower impulse control. And of course, ultimately they're unable to maintain a complex society if they're not under white rule. Anti-Semitism, they portray Jews as cunning, greedy, only interested in advancing their own people. There is obviously a Jewish conspiracy to control everything, global finance, entertainment industry, world governments, and they believe the Cold War paranoia of Jewish association, Bolshevism and communism and cultural Marxism. Anti-immigrant, they believe that outsiders will spoil the traditional way of life. Immigrants live off government welfare at the expense of taxpayers who are more deserving. Immigrants, especially ethnic minorities cause crime and disease and they outpace native birth rates. Immigration is a weapon of elitist globalist Jews to dilute white populations, which Amy mentioned, the great replacement. And in 2019, there were 527 hate crimes against Latinos in the US. Forget about the Jews and Muslims, we're at the top, but this is the highest number since 2010. So how do they go after Muslims? What do they say about Muslims? So we'll, we'll, we'll spend a few slides here so that you have a uh, appreciation for this. They believe that Islam is inherently promotes violence and terrorism. And their rhetoric is that every Muslim, whether he's an immigrant, refugee, asylum seeker, cannot be, it cannot be vetted and is a national security threat. And this resulted in legislation introduced to Congress, the Terrorist Refugee Infiltration Prevention Act, to place a moratorium on Muslim immigration from countries with a significant ISIS or Al Qaeda presence. They believe that Islam is not even a religion, that is simply a political ideology. And their rhetoric is Western Muslims want to take over the US using nonviolent stealth jihad to implement Sharia law and subvert US constitutional law. This resulted in US Congress introducing legislation to block Sharia in 22 states between 2011 to 13, and 16 states introduced a total of 27 anti-Sharia bills in 2014. And in North Carolina and Oklahoma, the bills passed. And of course, they believe that Islam is on course to populate and rule the whole world. Their rhetoric is Muslims are coming in large numbers to take over America as part of the great replacement, a plan to outnumber and replace whites declaring Western countries to be Sharia states. And this resulted in a ban Muslim ban, many of you heard about. They were banning refugees from entering the country. And this was an act of patriotism to defend the United States from being overwhelmed by Muslim immigrants. And finally, they believe that Muslims are not loyal patriots and they do not feel any connection with American history. Their rhetoric is that Islam, their Islam, uh, has no presence in America until recently. In other words, every 
Muslim is an immigrant, a recent immigrant. The values of Islam and the founding principles of American democracy are not mutually supportive. Elected officials and military persons cannot be trusted. Their plans are to make inroads by infiltrating the American political system. And this has resulted in defaming politicians, many politicians, upright politicians, by questioning the motive to serve, call for their removal, caricature them as extreme, even if they're not non-practicing secular Muslims, accuse them of guilt by association, i.e. Barack Obama and his father being a Muslim. And the reality is Muslims have had a constant presence in the United States since the 1700s. How do they exploit uh, spirituality? A Planned Parenthood in Delaware is vandalized with Christian symbols after an attack. How do Christian supremacists distort Christianity? So it, in 732, there was a battle of Poitiers. It was portrayed as a victory for Christian West over Muslim invaders, which groups like Generation Identity used to inspire Islamophobic and xenophobic actions today. And Christian history and symbols are used to represent Western civilization and Eurocentrism not necessarily intended to profess belief in Christian tenets, but especially targeted at Muslims, immigrants, and leftists. And the popular symbols that they use are medieval crusades, knights in armor, and God wills it. And how do they distort Christianity? Here is an image of a Ku Klux priest displaying the vestment with the blood drop of cross, primary symbol of the KKK. And theologically, Christian scriptures are wildly reinterpreted out of historical context to support white domination and discrimination. Non-canonical sources are included when convenient, forge history, pseudoscience, cherry pick scholarship, especially target Jews and spawn of Eve and serpent, Christ killers and people of color, meaning all of us, non-humans created before Adam. So how did white supremacists distort Christianity? And uh, they do it disparagingly. Some movements reject Christianity as inherently altruistic, nonviolent, and related to Judaism, even claiming it was a Jewish conspiracy to make Gentiles passive and alienated from their roots. They prefer racist, distorted forms of atheism, Norse paganism, new religious movements, occult Satanism, Hitlerism. I'm learning all these things as I'm speaking to you because I'm so fascinated that uh, that all of this, this, this variation actually exists out there. This is, this is a whole new area of, uh, you know, of learning for us. And the popular symbols that they use are uh, this racial war theory, Third Reich imagery, and other types of images. So what are we going to do? Why is up white supremacy? Is aim is to reach as many people as we possibly can. Uh, and we would like to do that by uh, really shaping public policy. And this is why we brought the different players together here so we can provide accurate information about white supremacist and hate groups to ensure elected officials and their advisors are crafting policies based on the best evidence and methods. And we'd like to do more public online e-learning online e to educate and equip students, allies, and faith leaders with in-depth knowledge about how to address white supremacy and hate groups so people can rapidly respond to incidents of hate speech and violence defending against white supremacist groups within their communities. And we can impact public opinion where if we disseminate to influencers and mass media, public officials, think tanks and academia to ensure that there's an accurate portrayal of how white supremacism actually operates and how its ideology is flawed in the ways all extremisms are in order to create a more informed and resilient public. And so I thank you very much, but of course the book is close to 150 pages and um, there is no, we, we, could, we could actually, uh, within the 10 minutes that we had to give you a full picture of what's in it, but it's actually a very fascinating read for myself. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daisy. Over to you. Yes, um, if there are any questions about um, the presentation or the content that Daisy described or another aspect of uh, Wise Up White Supremacy, then feel free to submit them in the comments. And um, as, we, as I look for any of those potential questions, uh, I want to um, pivot now to somebody who 
knows a lot of the ins and outs and the nuances of what's often a very complex and bewildering set of beliefs. Um, and uh, somebody who's used this knowledge now um, really in a very uh, redemptive um, and eye-opening way. Um, and that's Tony McAleer. Um, Tony is president of the Cure for Hate Consulting Group. Uh, Tony served as the executive director of Life After Hate from 2013 to 2017 after being instrumental in the organization's inception. Um, before Tony worked to help individuals exit from extremist groups, he spent 15 years within white supremacist movements. After departing from these movements and after uh, his involvement in uh, anti-racist and anti counter-extremist work, uh, de-radicalization work, he authored uh, The Cure for Hate in 2019, a former white supremacist's journey from violent extremism to radical compassion. And uh, Tony is going to talk about how much of the propaganda that you saw um, can be undermined by the testimony of former extremists, how the narratives and the false promises of extremist movements um, can be resisted by telling people that actually the members of these groups say that it's exhausting and very disillusioning to see the hypocrisy and infighting uh, that these groups um, are really like on the inside. Uh, and Tony can talk about much more than that, of course. Uh, we're very honored to have you, Tony, and um, the floor is yours. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on, uh, Sean and, and Daisy. Um, yeah, having spent 15 years in those movements um, and, and having healed um, what it was inside me that made those movements attractive in the first place has given me a very, very interesting perspective. Um, I truly believe that the level to which we dehumanize other human beings is a, is a mere reflection of our internal disconnection and dehumanization. And to live in that place of discord where everything feels wrong and we're angry about everything and then we want to project it onto the world, it is a truly exhausting place to be. And, you know, what, what happens is it's, it, it's not just a belief system. Um, it's an identity. So when I was enmeshed in that world and, and I... Tom Metzger was a mentor of mine when he was being sued by Morris Dees and that, that legal judgment. And I was involved very much in Aryan Nations too. But, you know, for me and so many of the people that we, that, that we have dealt with, identity and ideology become intertwined. So it's not just what somebody believes. Um, for me, it was... It was who I was, it was what I watched, it was the friends I hung out with, it was the books I read, the music I listened to, it was my, the entirety of my being. And it's, it's uh, we have to take that into account, that challenge when we're going to try and divert people out of that. And, and you know, one of the tricks is to separate the identity from, from the belief. Um, Daisy, you're right. It's absolutely misogynistic. I don't think. I don't think I witnessed a single healthy relationship in the 15 years that that, that I was in there, and and everything from physical, emotional, and verbal abuse. And I don't think I would have recognized a healthy relationship if they came and kissed me on the lips. Um, so <clears throat> we have to understand um, where people are at in their lives when they're enmeshed in these things. And sure, they can put on smiley faces on TV. And Tom Metzger was good at cracking a joke and, and being on TV. Uh, he just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, but he was a, a terribly tragic figure who was oozing anger, but putting on the, the sort of passive aggressive smiley, smiley face on that. And I think when we can uh, understand how people end up in this place, understand um, what these lives are like. Understanding doesn't in any way excuse what they've done, but it's the beginning of the potential for, for healing. And I, I love what um, the other guest, 
uh, doing the, the um, litigation, that's an important factor, an important tool. This, this is a very complex problem and it requires a, a, an arsenal of, of tools that are, are disposable. And I, I do believe it's incredibly important that we, we call people out in healthy ways in society, but we must also be prepared to call people in. And I think just as you can't have mercy without justice, you can't have justice without mercy. And I think when we combine that, that healing aspect as a possible avenue, um, prison is another possible avenue, depending on, on how the person responds. Um, I think it says something uh, about us as a society when we take these approaches, which um, I understand some people can't wrap their, their, their brain about around it and, and they have difficulty getting there. But we've, at Life After Hate, I think I, I left it almost exactly a year ago. And I think they've helped over 500 people um, come back from that, that, uh, that place of discord, that place of anger and hatred, which, which poisons our society. And I think, um, you know, if we can trigger disillusion in someone, so I spent 15 years in, in that space. Um, could I, with, with outside help, become disillusioned maybe after six or seven? If we can, ha we, if we can accelerate um, the, the time it takes disillusionment, uh, does that not create seven or eight years of harm reduction um, compared to if I'd, if I'd stayed in for, for, for 15 years. Well, I did stay in for 15 years. But I think there's, there's um, you know, we can't underestimate the impact of the people we pull back from that world, um, that the harm that they could have done in the future. We can never know that. We can never, never calculate it. But I can say um, 500 people, um, that for sure is, is a huge difference. And, you know, when, when I started one of the, as a co-founder, co Life After Hate, um, you know, we, we started off with, you know, how to, there was nobody there to help us. And we sort of stumbled and made our own ways out of it and then not the straightest line possible. And we thought, you know, when we co-founded it, you know, if we, how do we help other people do the same, the same path? And, and that's the sort of the journey and evolution, which has changed quite a bit uh, since 2011. Um, and it's become professionalized and, and more methodical and, and collecting data and, and having research uh, people look at the results. But at the end of the day, um, there's only so much, there's only so many of us around. There were six of us that were, uh, that were co-founders. And, you know, look at the scale of the problem that we have to deal with. There's no way it's possible for um, former such as myself to do it. We have to engage um, civil society. And this, this gets back to what you were saying, Sean, at the very beginning, these community led programs. And, you know, you know with, um, when I hired Sammy Rangel uh, to come on and, and provide a social work expertise and, and the, uh, the counseling experience that he has. And we, we thought, okay, well, we've, we've got a proof of concept here. How can we take that knowledge and train other people? And that's what we, that's what we started doing. And, you know, so give a, give a person a fish and they eat for a day, teach a, a person a fish and they feed a whole village. And I think that there is already existing resources in local communities, you know, not just law enforcement, but there's social workers and, you know, San Diego, uh, we were in, in uh, discussions with them. They have 50 social workers that, that do ride-alongs with police and, and uh, that kind of stuff because 30, 40% of police work is better handled by social workers sometimes. And, but they don't know how to deal with this problem because it seems so, so dark, so mysterious, so frightening. Um, but when we get in to understand it, um, existing known tools of counseling, therapy, and, and healing can very much be brought to bear. They just need a little bit of training and exposure to it to understand it. And so that is the, I think the, the role that uh, 
Life After Hate and my consulting company and, and that and, and the role of as a former, you know, not only do we stand up and show um, people that are in these groups that it's it's okay to leave, you know, to, by our own journey, we give them permission to, to follow suit. We can always help someone who's one or two steps behind where we are. And, you know, and then we can take our knowledge and share it with other community groups to empower them and, and to be available as a resource should they need, need help with that. And I think the society is recognizing that and, and sort of coming to bear with, with existing resources. And, and I think governments have trusted us so that they'll um, maybe provide the funding but not necessarily need to be the one delivering. And, and that requires a bit of um, trust, you know, because the, the tricky part about being in this work is we're, you know, we're in the sandbox right up against not just countering violent extremism, but counterterrorism. And that those lines can get to get blurry and, and for government law enforcement to know that they can trust us to do a duty to report when something, and at Life After Hate, we've had to do that a few times. Um, but we built these relationships and, and, and the, the, I think the fruit is coming to, to bear as, as we can empower other communities, because that's the only way we can scale this from, from a former's perspective is to empower other communities. And, you know, we've provided a proof of concept and it, it works. And I think, um, I mean, just life after hate 500 people, that that's a significant amount of, of harm reduction. And I know um, we're just a little bit limited by time, so I'll, I'll stop it there if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much, Tony. That's so, hearing that first firsthand account, uh, you know, it's very inspiring. And I sort of wonder as an activist, uh, as an organizer, couldn't we take these 500 and create some sort of a cadre of people with the former 500s that you have? And also I wanted to just share with you in Philadelphia, I was at a conference for that Aziz Natu had invited me. I think he's a participant here today. And uh, the uh, Assistant Attorney General Rob Reed mentioned that they have created a trauma healing center. The government has created a specific trauma healing center for individuals who may be experiencing the kind of things that you've talked about, the discord, family affliction, whatever is going on in people's lives. And so at least it'll be government funded, there'll be social workers, professionals running it. So it'll be fascinating to see. It's in its early stages. I'm happy to connect you with him. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think you could, you might be one of the consultants there, you know, because they are trying to bring people, you know, the, the hundreds that are out there into that, into that center and how do you recruit them and how do you find them and how do you put them through the system? So are there any questions for Tony? Question for, yes, yeah, Laura asks in the chat, uh, Tony, can you say something about what drew you in and what took you out of extremist white supremacy organizations? Um, let's put it in a nutshell, toxic shame drew me in. Um, toxic shame is, um, you know, that it's, that's what trauma leaves behind. And that's the feeling that we're less than, we're not good enough, we're weak, we're unlovable, all of these different things. And, you know, when I joined that, those groups, it, it wasn't, the ideology was part of it, but it wasn't the primary part. Um, the, sort of the, the, the pill I swallowed in order to get a sense of power when I felt powerless, I got attention when I felt invisible, and I got acceptance when I felt unlovable. And you know, we're, as human beings, we're desperate to have those things when they're lacking in our lives. And um, so if, if, if toxic shame is the feeling of being less than human, then um, the antidote is compassion. And when we're compassionate with someone, we hold a mirror up to them and allow them to see their um, reflection, their humanity reflected back at them. Compassion, when we, we're compassionate with people, we rehumanize them. And before I dehumanized anybody, I was dehumanized myself. And once I went through uh, d different experiences and different processes to rehumanize, then I can recognize the humanity in, in, in everybody else. And so in a nutshell, uh, toxic shame is the, was, was what drew me in and, and compassion was the cure. Thank you, Tony. And to, to open that nutshell, you just need to watch the film, which is going to comprise the second half of tonight's event. 
Uh, Tony is um, one of the central uh, figures in this film and it follows him and his colleagues uh, and several former extremists um, in their journey uh, and the important things they have to say about our current moment. Um, also his book, uh, The Cure for Hate goes into this in detail and uh, I would recommend it to anybody um, so Tony, we are so grateful that you could join and shed that insight. And um, we're gonna move to another writer now, uh, someone who has a very different uh, background and uh, input on this topic. Um, we are going to welcome Heidi Beadle, uh, who is a journalist from the Colorado Springs Independent. Um, Heidi was very generous to allow Wise to use several photographs and her coverage of um, white supremacist extremism uh, really stood out to me. So um, Heidi, we are interested to hear what insights you can share about this topic um, from your journalistic experience. And um, the floor is yours. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Heidi Beadle, um, I'm from Colorado. Springs, Colorado. Um, before I became a journalist, I actually um, got involved in this subject. Um, I was part of the Colorado Springs Anti-Fascists, which was um, basically an Antifa organization. Um, and as a number of people mentioned, you know, these white supremacist groups have a lot of uh, terrible ideologies in terms of misogyny and the racism and the Islamophobia. Um, they're also terribly um, homophobic as well. And um, I myself as a trans person, I kind of came out and got involved in a lot of these organizing efforts against white supremacist um, organizations as a direct result of um, kind of the Milo Yiannopoulos stuff that was going on in 2016. Um, and from there, I kind of got involved in both researching these groups and identifying specific members um, and kind of watching the rise and eventual sort of implosion of organizations like the Traditional Workers Party, um, which was present in Charlottesville under Matthew Heimbach, um, the Proud Boys, um, who kind of got started here in Colorado um, shortly after the Milo Yiannopoulos tour in 2016, as well as Identity Europa, um, which uh, rebranded itself as the American Identity Movement, and then um, just this year announced that they were no longer um, functioning. So I've seen a lot of these groups kind of grow and start recruiting, and then I've also kind of seen them um, sort of fall apart. And in terms of um, insights and things moving forward, I would say, um, it's really important to kind of recognize the value of those like very local, um, you know, and I know Antifa becomes this kind of hot button topic for some people and some organizations in terms of who they want to work with. But um, we've kind of seen in the last four years, the way that these local networks who keep track of individual members and keep track of connections, um, kind of create this massive database. Um, you know, the Colorado Springs anti-fascists were very active and still very active in this kind of work, um, as well as Rose City anti-fascists anti in the Pacific Northwest around Portland. Um, and these, you know, outside of like the Southern Poverty Law Center and a couple other organizations that are doing this kind of tracking, um, there aren't as many resources as there probably should be for something of this magnitude. So continuing um, the kind of almost citizen journalist approach to tracking white supremacist groups is, is really important. Um, once I became a professional journalist myself, I mean, I, I was out of activism for almost a year before I became a journalist anyway, but um, you know, I don't engage with um, the activist side of things anymore, but I do pay attention to the trends and the things that we're kind of seeing. And in the last four years, I mean, you saw a lot of anti-fascist groups like doxing white supremacists, getting them fired. Um, and that was a tremendously successful tactic. I mean, Richard Spencer admitted it, that Antifa was winning um, back in like 2017. Um, and you've seen it with the fall of, again, Traditional Workers Party, um, Identity Europa. Um, the problem though, is that, you know, you dox these guys and they kind of, unless there's something like Tony's organization or kind of a network, um, these guys just go back to it. Uh, the members of Traditionalist Worker Party that I exposed in 2017 are still in the Denver area involved in politics and getting up to all sorts of things. Um, and that maybe is like the, the the good example, because on the on inverse side of that, you're seeing um, a lot of these groups become more radicalized. So Identity Europa and like the Proud Boys are very 
tame organizations, comparatively speaking, to like um, Adam Waffen Division or the base or these more explicitly national socialist and accelerationist groups. And we're seeing a lot more of those and we're seeing a lot of the rhetoric kind of accelerate um, as we saw today with right wing groups in Salem, Oregon, trying to take over um, the Capitol there during a legislative session and the way the boogaloo and militia movement is kind of coalescing around a lot of bizarre conspiracy theories. Um, it's, it's moving away from just kind of the relatively, mm. I, don't, I don't wanna say tame, I mean, it's a very fraught kind of difficult thing, but that the, I guess, field of like doxing and kind of observational stuff and confronting people at rallies, um, it's becoming more like, armed groups confronting people and, you know, shooting at each other and various terrorist acts. So those are things that mm -hmm. need to kind of watch out for in the coming years, unfortunately. Yeah. And the, uh, the I think the, the, the broad toolkit is more important now than ever, because if previous efforts to uh, resist extremism uh, have been, you know, too narrowly focused, lacking proper methods, then um, this extremist polarization uh, is just going to continue as it has. So um, there is a solid opportunity uh, for us to have a significant effect against it. Uh, Amy, before when she was talking about the lawsuit against the Charlottesville Unite the Right organizers, did mention that in internal discord chats, which I think were leaked by Unicorn Riot, which is one example, right, of a yes. uh, of an, of, of an anti-fascist collective that uses the means of, um, you know, just finding messages uh, and again, a broad, a broad range um, of different available topics that we can use to be better than these uh, extremist groups. So thank you so much for your insights, um, Heidi. And uh, I'm gonna look forward to your future reporting. Um, so with that, then uh, we are going to prepare for our final panelist tonight and our co-host, um, Director Peter Hutchison, uh, who's so pivotal in getting this uh, event um, to be as successful and unique as it is. Uh, Peter uh, is, more than a director, um, Peter has a master's degree in counseling psychology with a focus on addictions and systems dynamics. And seeing his film through that light really, I think, um, deepens the appreciation and uh, shows how there are things that each individual person can do in their own domain. And one of the most important things we can do for laypersons is to support the experts and the specialists. Um, Peter Hutchison, um, in addition to his uh, psychological credentials, um, is an award-winning filmmaker and uh, New York Times best-selling author. Uh, he produced and directed Requiem for the American Dream, Noam Chomsky and the Principles of Concentration of Wealth and Power. Um, he has a long-standing commitment to issues around male identity, um, which you'll see in the film. Uh, and other works of his, such as the man card, white male identity politics from Nixon to Trump. And um, Peter can talk about his filmmaking process, uh, what he learned or what would be valuable to share from the process of the film and um, the factors that lead to extremist recruitment and radicalization uh, and how we can resist it. Um, and we will have a trailer of the film that will set up just as a little appetizer uh, to the main screening. Um, but first, we're going to have Peter take the floor and um, give us even more insight. Thank you. Um, before Peter takes the floor, may I just suggest that you please put a link of the film right in the chat right now? Because if somebody has to leave and they want to purchase the film right now, they can watch the film until January. So if we can just do that, because people, some people do have to leave. Thank For you. For sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I will post it again here. Peter, you're on. Hi, say thanks, Sean. Thanks for the introduction and thanks, Daisy. Thanks for putting this together and having me uh, as a participant. Um, it's, uh, as I said earlier, before we actually got on um, with everybody else, uh, I. I'm really impressed with this coalition of 
of peoples and organizations that you've been able to pull together. And um, I'm really grateful for that. Um, you know, I don't claim to be an expert on countering violent extremism. Um, I actually set out to make a film exploring masculinity in the United States uh, and um, ended up ended up thanks to Michael Kimmel who wrote the uh, exceptional book called uh, Healing from Hate uh, being introduced to uh, a number of these formers and Michael suggested considering considering this as an angle to explore masculinity in the United States through. Um, and after I got to meet a few of these guys and got to know them, um, I, saw, I saw the potential and, and I saw the interest that, that Michael shared in their remarkable stories and, and how it really provides a, a unique lens to see what's happening with masculinity in the United States in a lot of respects. Um, I, uh, I think Tony really, he's, Tony's so articulate and has done such a great job of sort of laying out what draws a lot of these men into hate groups. And I found that this is almost universal in, in almost everyone I've talked to. Um, uh, every single one of these formers that participated in this film they, um, they had childhood trauma, um, shame, issues around their identity, um, absent fathers, uh, conditions that really set them up for recruitment into these organizations. People who, you know, people who really had felt a deep seated need for you know, some sort of belonging and meaning and community and sense of purpose and even power in some respects. You know, I, I and it's the, you know, it's, it's the ideology that often is secondary for a lot of these people, that it, it, it has to do with identity more than anything. And the ideology comes later for a lot of these people. Um, I'm not saying that by any means that a lot of these men didn't grow up in racist households. Um, I'm not saying that they didn't get to learn this sort of messaging from their communities and from their families, but it is a remarkably consistent factor in a lot of these men's recruitment uh, into hate groups. Um, and I think it's really important to understand um, the more I got to know these guys, the more I became intrigued with, you know, what what are the roots of hatred? You know, are they innate? Are they learned? And I, I think, in in part at least, I, I I was really provided with a unique lens on on how it's learned. And I think if if we can really if we take the time and we approach it with a true compassion and curiosity about where that comes from, we have a, we've got a big leg up. We've got a big chance at putting a dent on, um, on these sorts of dynamics continuing as we move forward as a, as a culture and in our society. And I hope that the film provides um, a template for that that it provides some really valuable anecdotes in terms of relationships that have really shifted people's viewpoints in terms of racism. Um, and a lot of people ask me, well, how, how is it that this film can help us understand what's happening in the country right now with racism. How, how it, what is it that you'd like for people to take away? And I think the most important point for me, which I, I've heard Tony say time and time again, is that you know no individual is irredeemable. And I think that the film does, if it does nothing else, I think it does lay out an incredibly strong case 
for that fact that no individual is irredeemable. And as a nation, I think that we can we can extrapolate that out and operate with the hope that no nation is irredeemable. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I truly hope that as a filmmaker that that's a, a fundamental point that people are able to take away with them. Great, thank you so much, Peter. I actually have a question for you that was sent to me early on, somebody who saw your trailer already, uh, Healing From Hate, shows how formers can help others by listening, respecting, and guiding back to a sense of our common humanity. Thanks for doing this. And the question is, what can people who are not formers do to support the healing? Well, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, I think these formers really lead by example. I don't think that you have to be a former to exhibit the, uh, exhibit the, the sort of behavior and engagement that is really helpful in terms of turning the tides of hate. Um, I, I, I've, I've heard Tony and Sammy as well use, use the phrase compassion, curiosity, and courage. And I think that that can be applied for anyone's engagement with issues around, around hate. It's, uh, having a compassionate approach to engagement. It's about having a, a true curiosity in the other person, um, a genuinely engaged and authentic curiosity, really wanting to understand why the other person thinks the way they do and where, where those thoughts come from and, and having a courage, the courage to step out of your comfort zone and do something different, you know, uh, take a risk uh, and I think that those are all crucial aspects of, of things that all of us can do. I, you know, every, single, every single subject in the film has an example of when someone from whom they least deserve compassion has stepped forward to extend that to them. And oftentimes that's come in the context of being listened to, being heard, uh, as Tony has said, you know, uh, for people to feel as if their humanity has been seen for the first time. And we may not even, we may not even realize that we're having that sort of impact when we engage on that level. But every single former has a really pivotal story about someone, someone who engaged with them on that level, someone from whom they received that sort of compassion and understanding when they least deserved it. And it's, it, it was a truly transformative experience for all of them. Thank you yeah. very much, Peter. And Sean, are we going to share the trailer? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the link is there, uh, Daisy, if, if um, you wouldn't mind screen sharing before, um, as, as with the PowerPoint. Um, I think that with the responses to even the case of an individual, who is maybe seeking to leave an extremist group um, or in the broader struggle against white supremacist narratives in society, um, again, a holistic response. There is somebody who could reach that person, that extremist, especially if they are in a place where they are able to be reached or perhaps somewhat alienated or exhausted from their lifestyle uh, and hate groups. Um, there maybe is somebody who can reach them uh, give them a sense of compassion that perhaps they feel that they don't deserve. Um, and there are other members of uh, community groups who um, I've also heard Tony say in the past um, that have a contribution to make um, in perhaps petitioning their local government or perhaps um, funding or supporting or spreading awareness of the type of work that Integrity First for America is doing um, or supporting local journalists. Um, it's, it, it can't be that, you know, the, especially the people who are harmed by previous extremists, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that the film does very powerfully um, is shows the forgiveness that is offered to these extremists from the very communities that are like the communities who they harmed. Um, it's not their obligation of, you know, say a, a person of color um, to do that, but they do have a role elsewhere, 
everybody can perform a unique role and everybody can be part of the solution. Um, and uh, you know, organizations like ours um, are trying to build those networks and give people outlets. You want to do something? Here is something concrete you can do. Um, you know, we've thought of it. We've put it in front of you. And you know, come join us. That's right. And I, I think it's important to point out that in a lot of these cases, these stories that are told by formers, um, it's it's not it's not experts, quote unquote, who have engaged with them. It's just simply people in their lives, people who they've come across in their community. You know, it doesn't take it doesn't take an expert to change somebody's heart or to make somebody feel heard. Yes. I want to make it very clear here that I'm, I'm, I am by no means saying that people don't need to be held accountable for their actions. I, right. 100% they need to be held accountable for actions. But I think, you know, the important thing to, to keep in mind is that, you know, there is still a human being in there, regardless of how heinous or dehumanizing some of their actions have been towards other people. And as Tony talks about, that's not going to change until you can get someone back in touch with their own humanity. Um, I think that's a really crucial point. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to sh uh, to do this because I don't know if it'll actually work because sometimes yeah. sound doesn't come across. If the sound doesn't come across, we'll just send a link in the chat then. Is it working? We believe that we're the superior race. We were here first, and this is our country. Look at me. I'm on the edge of the, the vanguard to save the white race. Guns, ammo, steel toe, Doc Martens, tattooing. Violence was just prerequisite to enter or exit. Life After Hate was founded by ex-neo-Nazi white supremacists, and they knew that they wanted to help other guys get out. I can't tell you how many hundreds of people while they're in the movement, are too afraid to leave. What really changed me was receiving compassion from the people that I least deserved it from, when I least deserved it. You've got to find a way to find an affirmation with every discussion, no matter how bad it feels that it's going. It takes guts to do that. This is why the intervention can't rely on my charisma. We are like the anti-venom to hate, you know what I mean? Because we have, we had that venom in us and we know how to spew it and we know how to also make it an anti-venom. You should have been so badly broken that there's no way you could come back from this. If you did, so can he. Right. Someone in that life who may not be aware that there's a way out, what would you say to them? Let go all the hate. That hate ruins you. You humanized him, which allowed him to humanize you. Like that, that's not rocket science, but yeah, it's, it's evading the majority of the country right now. It's a lot of change that you're getting thrown at you right now. You know? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Mm -hmm. You guys have been lifelongs. That's why I think you're, you're, you're irreplaceable. You know? We are operating as human beings from one of two places fear or love. And we get to choose which one that is. Fantastic. So we wow. hope that you will all join us. <laughs> that was powerful, Peter. <laughs> now I just have to find that moment to sit there and watch it. <laughs> well, so we... the film is only $9.99, so please purchase the film and you can watch it anytime between now and what is it, January 15th, we said? Um, There's I... a window of seven days, I believe, from, oh. uh, from the download. And yeah, so... So it'd be as long as January seventh, I oh, guess. Actually, I would, I would, I would recommend folks uh, get the link as soon as you can and and find some time over the next week to uh, to watch it. Um, it's, you know, this this whole event, of course, um, and the topic that we're all interested in um, addressing and turning around um, is a very difficult one, um, and you know, it's easy for me to say. I've never even experienced any, um, you know, firsthand victimization. Um, but 
it is so important. And I think uh, just to say my own concluding thanks and appreciation to everybody before turning it over to Daisy, um, it's, it's very appropriate that this event would happen on the winter solstice when starting tomorrow, the sun is going to start coming back and there is some light to look forward to. And this whole field and advocates and um, practitioners and organizations like ours um, have much to look forward to, much to contribute to this paradigm shift. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's daunting and um, you know, it's not going to happen by itself but we can continue to make serious advancements and inroads. So I would suggest sometime over the next week, uh, watch the film, consider what the new year can bring and how you can be a part of it. And uh, stay tuned for future events and future releases from everybody uh, who has um, been so gracious with their, with their time and input tonight. Uh, and thank you all again, Daisy. Thank you so much. Well, <clears throat> I've learned a lot, not only from today, but I've also learned a lot from doing the research that Sean has been spearheading. It's incredible to me the kind of subculture that exists within the United States uh, that is growing uh, by leaps and bounds, and there is an attraction, there, is, there are leaders, there are organizations, and this does not feel that different than what Daesh, Al-Qaeda were doing for years by recruiting innocent, vulnerable people. And I know one person have direct, direct uh, relationship with one person that got caught up, as Tony mentioned, just from fam family trauma, got caught up and was supposed to be incarcerated for more than 60 years. But because we had published a book, I was brought in as an expert. And, and then I realized that she was not an ideologue. It was all about identity. It was all about personal issues. It, it was about finding a job. It was about finding husband and, you know, and not to be marginalized, the belonging, the things that you just mentioned, both of you. And so there are many similarities. And for me, the way for her reintegration, and I wish that she could have been with us tonight, is because she has to be in touch with somebody who is her life coach. And I have de facto become her life coach. And this is the level, this is the level that this stuff is gonna get down to because these people have needs, they have emotional needs, they have financial needs, they have personal needs. And so um, to the extent each, each one of us can do our part, you know, we really need to go after them legally because that's where the leadership comes in. That's where you break down the networks and you break down, you know, their whole sort of infrastructure. But, uh, but when these people come out, they need help and they need to be transformed and need to, need to get reintegrated back into society. So at WISE, what we tried to do was we always like to go digging deep into things. We try to gather the information so that we could end this extremism and hate at its root. Uh, we developed really good content that is going to be coming out in a form of a book. Sean is telling me probably by March, we will have the book published uh, and that we have actual knowledge where we can defeat this persistence and also you know, really help people. Uh, we think that we will have a really good blueprint because the blueprint with knowledge, with practitioners, with the kind of network that we have here, that's the blueprint, right? We need a blueprint that where we work from different sides. Um, and then, you know, we can build networks. We can extend these networks. I mean, today's a small showing because there are many commitments going on, but I know many of you are really committed to this work and you will extend this out. You will share the film with other people. And then ultimately, we should have an honest dialogue about what's happening in America. What is the root cause of this? Why do we have these, this so, so much angst going on? And, uh, and, and this is, you know, for me, um, you know, promoting values of inclusion, peace, pluralism, th those are words, those are nice words, but each of us that are committed to advancing those have to do our part. And so that is why I brought all of you together who are really practitioners and committed to this work to see how we might be able to work together in 2021 to further this because 70 million people voted for a particular person whom we know is committed to a certain kind of 
you know, the kinds of values that we don't espouse. And there are many people on the fence in the middle who don't know how to think about this issue. And those are the people we need to target and we need to educate and we need to bring and, and, and rally them around before we get to the nuts and bolts of Tony's people because we can't reach them, but we can reach our people that are on the fence. They don't know how to think about this issue. So I thank you very much and thank you Sean for doing a excellent job. He has been dedicated to this research for the last two years. And thank you, Amy, Natalia, I know is gone. And thank you, uh, Heidi. That was great. Listening to Heidi was amazing. And, uh, and if anybody else would like to say a few things, parting words, I'm still here. We're still here. Tony, anything from you, Peter? I just want to thank everyone for being a part of this and helping to put it together. Um, it's um, films take a tremendous amount of time and investment. I mean, I worked uh, almost three years on this film, all in. And it's having the opportunity to share the film with people and hopefully create a dialogue around the issues. That's the reason why I make films to begin with. So this kind of forum is ideal for me. It's, it's, it's what, what I really hope to see come out of the films that I make. So I, I, really, I really appreciate you guys helping to put this together. Thank you so much. And I've just included a little um, button for all of you. It's called wisemuslimwomen.org donate. It's a specific button which takes you to our donate page. I'm not asking you to donate generally, but if you want to order your book in advance, uh, you can. And if you want to just generally support us, you can. And all the monies go towards mm -hmm. furthering all of our works together and specifically this, this program. So uh, the link is there and uh, I thank you all for joining us and Peter will be in touch and we'll create a little email chain with all of you here uh, so that we can stay in touch. Thank you so much. And I look forward to viewing your film. Thank you all for joining us and any other parting words, Tony? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say we have a tremendous impact on the world when we change and have become very conscious of who we are in every moment of every day and where we can add compassion, courage, and curiosity um, instead of judgment to our day, uh, we can change the world and make, make it a better place. Thank More you. compassion, less judgment. Thank you. Amy, anything from you? Is Amy still here? Amy, no. I think, I think, I think Amy has a runoff earlier, but... Uh, uh, all right, and uh, anybody, Theo, anything from you, Global Citizen Circle? I know you were here patiently from the very beginning. Well, I just wanna thank you um, all for, for um, speaking about this, such a critical issue right now. And um, we were really so happy that you included us, Daisy, in the program. Um, you know, it, there's just so much to learn. Like you said, Daisy, you're learning as you're, as you're doing the research and, um, you know, with every opportunity to participate in something like this, you learn something new. And um, so I appreciate this very, very much. And for those of you who haven't seen the film, it's great. So please <laughs> do tune into it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for the plug because we needed to hear from somebody who'd actually seen the whole film. That's great. And I know Marissa is here, who's a former Intel person. I know Marissa will have great interest in this. So all of you who are here, I know that you're very committed to peace building. So please join us in not only shedding light on Peter's film, but on Tony's work, on Amy, you know, the work that the litigation people are doing, all of these things come together are going to have some sort of traction. So I thank you all for joining us. Sean, anything you would like to say as a parting word? No, no, just very glad that we, uh, we, we were all here to spend the evening together in a very eye-opening uh, and empowering way. And um, I am going to go and revisit the film now. Uh, follow the link, sit back, be gripped by it, be encouraged by it. And uh, when the credits roll, that is the end of this event. So thank you all and uh, hope to inform you of the next step uh, and meet again in Zoom, maybe even in person one day. Um, mm -hmm. Imagine that. And thanks again. Well, thank you so much for our 
uh, technical guru who's in the back, yeah, Tasmin. Thank oh, you. Yes, thank you, Yasmin. For being the co-host, co and also for our co-sponsors who joined us, Gazala and Mike, uh, all of you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Goodbye.